Hey, this is Adam. Welcome to my Rare Classic Car Channel. Today, the 1974 Marquis Brome versus the Oldsmobile 88 Royale. Now, admittedly, these cars aren't perfectly comparable one-to-one. -one. This is a Marquis Brome versus an 88 Royale, so the Marquis Brome would have been priced a little bit higher. But nonetheless, even if this were a regular Marquis trim, I'll talk about some of the key differences and how one might perceive the driving impressions versus the Olds especially given that there really wasn't much of a driving dynamics difference between the 88 and 98 and the standard Marquis and the Marquis Brome. But first, a quick look at the Marquis Brome here for 74. In 1974, Ford did a couple things. They changed the front end here from 73. So they have the headlight doors just like the 73 does. All the way up to 78, they had the headlight doors, but on the 73s, the grill continued into the headlights and on 74, they redid it so that there was this mercury block lettering up here. And the grill terminated after this central point and didn't spill into the headlights anymore. So one difference. And the grill also became, unfortunately, plastic. So you are a lucky person indeed if you have one of these 74 mercuries and you don't have a chipped tooth out of the grill like Fortunately, this one does not because that's pretty common from stone chips, particularly on the freeway. Another interesting thing, only for two years, Mercury had this logo, which is kind of a Lincoln logo, rotated sideways with a few little slats up at the top and a wreath around it. And then in 75, they moved it 90 degrees to be straight up and down with a wreath that went around it that way. So... They were trying to get it to have more of this Lincoln feel, I guess, if you will, even in the emblem. This car does have the 460 cubic inch V8, which was rated at a whopping 190 horsepower. But even in the 190 horsepower form, this car does not suffer from any lack of power driving around town. It has plenty of torque, plenty of stoplight takeoff power. I bought this car in Arkansas. Actually, somebody on Facebook approached me because they knew I loved Mercury's and this was his grandfather's and he just didn't know how to take care of it. It needed a few things. Wanted to know if I wanted to potentially buy it. And it just looked to be a great automobile and thankfully was. Needed a few things. Back window motors, which are very typical on these. The window motors have plastic uh, gears in them that over time will just shred themselves and then you'll hear the motor spin but nothing happens when you hit the power window switch so I had both of those repaired by Tony Lawler of Vandalia Illinois and he did an excellent job he also replaced those in some of my other Mercury's so now I have all working window motors And this car has quite a few options. Nice thing, I, it didn't come with it, but I found a spare set of near NOS luxury wheel covers, which I love. I think just really set the car off. But 74 for Mercury was a unique year where they had a lot of one year only things. This tail lamp treatment is one year only. They brought the emblem back over the trunk keyhole here in 74. It was gone for 72 and three. It was there in 71. so. This trunk emblem kind of comes and goes on the Mercury's of that generation for whatever reason. And on the inside, it has a one year only interior. This is the twin comfort lounge seat interior, which has this unique, I don't know what you call that, filigreed trim. Very much resembling the early 70s Buick Electra Limited interior. So I don't know if Ford copied that or they were both in development at the same time, but again, this is only year for that style seat on the marquee bromes so in this year there was the base marquee there was the marquee brome and there was a grand marquee interior as well this is the marquee brome interior and if we get inside this is the first year for the orange or reddish index pointer in 73 ford went to this common style instrument panel across Ford as well as Mercury. There was a different dash pad, some different vents, but it was largely the same and Lincoln took it later. But 73, these index pointers were all white, the fuel gauge, speedometer, 
and the gear shift, and then they went to red in 74, presumably because it's a little bit hard to read if everything was white. And this is the last model year for having a separate oil light. In 75, they went to an engine light, which combined the oil and temperature together into one. So you didn't quite know what was wrong, but you knew you had an engine problem. And this car does have the factory cruise control, does have air conditioning, one speaker AM radio, which means there's no speakers down there in the door panel. And a really unique and nice door panel overall here. They went back to the dome light in 73 after not having it in, oh, let's see, 68 through 71. 68 through 72s don't have a dome light. And they also added this shag carpet in 73, which continued for 74, that's extremely plush. But just overall, a nice package for a car. All this is soft touch up here, here. This armrest is soft touch, though this is hard. So that's not quite as nice as the 71 and 2s to have this hard touch plastic here. They did go to electric door locks in 73, so not pneumatic. Before that, it was pneumatic. And you did get a super-sized glove box, that's for sure. You can hold quite a bit in there. Let's take a look at the trunk, and you're going to see a big difference between Ford and the other makes of the era and that Ford had the vertical fuel tank that afforded it a really unique trunk shape that some people loved and other people did not like. So you have this very deep well here that is great if you're trying to hold a lot. It can kind of be tough to stoop over though, so I think it was a mixed reaction to whether or not people, people liked that in these cars. But nonetheless, a really, really huge trunk about 20 cubic feet. And I guess there's a quality sticker there, Paint OK Thompson. So thank you, Mr. Thompson, for deeming the paint on this car to be OK. I'm assuming it's a mister. Could be a missus back then. You never know. I'll pop the hood, and we can take a look at the detuned 460 here. So as I mentioned, it was 190 horsepower by this year. Not great, but boy, this car really just accelerates away from a stoplight with no hesitation, no issues at all. It does have the 74 starter interlock deactivator. So early in 74, there was a, you had to have your seatbelt buckled in order for the car to start. And people hated that because you have to buckle your seatbelt to pull the car in the garage. So they eliminated that after uh, after the first half year, but you'd push that button and it would reset it once and allow you to start the car without buckling your seat belt. That's since been disconnected on this car as it was on many cars. Lots of coffee cans for all the vacuum systems, the cruise and the headlights. You can see the cruise servo up there. I have put a new master cylinder on this car recently. I did recore the radiator. New water pump. Water pumps on these are not fun. You've got a spacer plate that you have to clean off. The bolts tend to like to seize in there. So I've got a few tricks maybe I'll talk about in a later video that one can employ to get that off, but not fun. But nonetheless, a really handsome car. I mean, look at that front end that we're just coming at you. Even with the railroad tie bumpers that were in place in 74 because of the five mile an hour crash standard, it's just an overall handsome look. So let's take it for a drive. So getting into the Mercury, one of the things that you notice, particularly versus the Olds, is I would say the interior materials seem a bit richer. You've got a nicer carpet here. A full, full, full wood grain dash for what it's worth, but it does appear quite rich. The seats are very comfortable. I would say squishy in terms of padding. It overall just feels soft. 
I guess is the best adjective I can say. So let's start it up and go for a brief drive. But you know, compared to the old, the doors also on this car close so nicely. I mean, you can just pull with one finger gently, and they make a great noise. This car also has even the original dealer key tag, dealer key tag Putnam Lincoln Mercury from Fort Smith, Arkansas, where this car lived for most all of its life. The immediate feeling you get when you're driving this car around is smoothness and an extremely nautical ride. You know, when you turn the wheel in this car, the Ford, you wind the wheel a lot more than in the GMs. The steering box is a, a lot slower. The cornering on this car is not great at all. The Oldsmobile has almost an inch diameter stabilizer bar front. This has a three-quarter inch diameter stabilizer bar and softer springs than the Olds, even the Olds in base form. So this car is just set up to be soft all the way around. And as you go over this frost heaved pavement, it's almost like sitting in a waterbed. You have the soft suspension coupled with an extremely squishy seat that are making sure that you really don't feel hardly any of the road imperfections. And watch it as I go around this corner, it's funny, you turn and it almost feels like a second delay between when you turn the wheel and when the car starts moving. But just effortless cruising, very quiet, So much softer than the Olds. Softer, more wallowy. I mean, if I had to pick a car in city traffic to scoot around in, it would not be this. While the Olds and this are the same size, roughly, this thing just handles like a big car. That's to say, it really doesn't handle much at all, to be honest. I'm barely touching the pedal. Boy, this 460 makes great noises. So you can hear it there. Overall, just a smooth, smooth ride. Very comfortable, very quiet. And if you were looking for ride over handling, this was the car of choice. This thing is just ab absolutely smooth over almost any form of pavement. And this car was engineered with radial tires too. So the cars of the air weren't and you put radials on them and they ride more harshly. This one does not. This one rides really well with radials. So overall impressions of the Marquis, it just really depends on what you like. If you like very soft ride, not great handling, good quality in terms of the door closures and the body fits, you're gonna like this car. If you want something that actually has some handling prowess, uh, yeah, this isn't the car for you. But I love I love these Mercury's. They're my favorite. Just for effortless cruising, it, it can't be beat. All right, thanks for watching. So here we are on the freeway for a quick sec using a new head-mounted camera. And you can hear it's just absolutely quiet at speed. Nothing but a wonderful ride in this car. I would take this car on a road trip anytime. The Twin Comfort lounge seats are especially comfortable. 
great thickly padded armrests. Just an overall wonderful place to be. As long as you don't want a good handling car. All right, so on to the 75 Olds 88 hardtop coupe. So while one might argue the Marquis Brome is probably priced a little bit closer to the Olds 98, there's quite a few similarities. So the Olds 88 and the Marquis Brome both shared a 124-inch wheelbase. The Olds 98 was on a 127-inch wheelbase. And both this 88 and the Marquis Brome were about 226 inches long. Whereas the 98, because of its longer wheelbase and overhangs, was 232 inches long. So, we'll call it a pretty fair comparison overall. Obviously, this is a coupe and the Mercury was a sedan. But many things don't change between those, aside from the body style. But the interiors and the powertrains, suspension systems, etc. are quite similar between the coupes, sedans, even the 88s and 98s. So certainly a different treatment in terms of the front end. Mercury was much more of a flat, you know, vertical, I would say, front end. And Ohl still has a bit of this W shape to it if you look from above. So called because these fender peaks and the middle of the hood poke out a bit more than the rest of it. Albeit it was toned down from how pronounced this was on something like the 67 Oldsmobile that you can also see on my channel. And the Oles has this really interesting grill that dips below the bumper. So in spite of the five mile an hour impact standard, they gave it a little bit of style. And I think this car just, while it's a corpulent car, I would say, the black lens and air of sveltness to it, it's kind of like someone uh, wearing a black outfit, even though they're a bit portly, a la Johnny Cash toward the latter part of his career. I'll say that the GM cars of this generation also had a lot more sculpture in terms of the body side with the tumble home. The Ford is much more straight up and down vertical. Not much character on the Ford aside from the little ditch between the top of the door and the window. But this has a lot of curvature, sculpture, whether you like it or not. And the colonnade era coupes, I often think they kind of look a bit awkward from a proportion standpoint, but without the vinyl roof, this one does look really good. And as you can see, they still were hard tops. This little window, the back window, does go down. It's just not that large of a window. There's the big fixed glass portion behind it. But I would say overall it's a handsome car. This car does have the optional sport mirrors on either side. It does have the wire wheel covers. Cornering lights, you can see. Inside it does have passenger seat, tilt wheel, an AM radio with a power antenna, power trunk release. No air conditioning though. Which just means I drive it on a day like today where it's 75 and sunny as opposed to a day where it's 95 and hot. I will say another thing about the difference between GM and Ford, you can really start to see GM was slipping in the quality era during this time with you know these big door gaps really on either side of the door the metal just didn't spread as much and you get all these little imperfections it's hard to see you know, here, but you can actually see the blob of sealer. You can see it right about there. If I move back and forth, it's wavy where the quarter panel meets the roof. They started making these window moldings out of plastic. And while this car has always been garage from day one, you can see they're starting to fade. This, this tip piece is metal though, and they've shrunk a little bit. This blobby seam sealer here from the tulip panel to the quarter panel. This just would never pass uh, muster even 20 years ago. But it did back then. And there are various little dings and flaws. Like this is an up ding here. I don't know if you can see it. 
In other words, it's poking outward. There's one up here on the roof too. And it could just be, you can see it's wavy. The reflection of the light is wavy. And those are just factory defects. That's not that somebody did something to it. That's how these cars came. Again, kind of a blobby job here. This side is better, I would say, in terms of not being able to detect the waviness, but it is still there. And some sort of paint mar there. I don't know if you can kind of see it. That's just a factory, factory defect. And look at this door gap. So the Ford, in terms of the quality of the fits and the paint and everything, I feel was just much, much better during this period. And Ford advertised it. They said uh, there, was a com there was a commercial with Hugh Downs that they would advertise that I've seen on YouTube where it would basically say that the closer you look, the better we look. And that was quite fair of the Fords. I mean, they were assembled with, I would say, more care than the GM cars like this. Maybe because they sold less of the Fords, these GM cars were quite popular, selling really well, and I wouldn't be surprised if the line speed on, in Lansing, pumping out these Oldsmobiles, was faster than the line speed in St. Louis, pumping out the Mercury's, only because the Mercury sold about 25,000 copies new, and these 88s, 98s, etc., were selling in the hundreds of thousands combined volume. So it probably afforded Mercury a bit more care. Although the LTDs were better assembled too than the Chevrolets. And they sold well, albeit not necessarily as well as the GM offerings. But that said, this car is a really nice time capsule just to show what a car was like back then that you got new, flaws and all. That's how it was delivered. If you haven't seen my other videos, then you may not know this car I got from Northern Wisconsin. It was on Facebook Marketplace. And it has 4,479 miles, of which I probably put 50 or 60 miles on since I've purchased it. Oh, I forgot it also has the AM radio with power antenna. When I talked to the original owner of the car, she said that there weren't really any FM stations in Northern Wisconsin, so why order the FM radio? So she got this, oh, that key buzzer's gonna drive me nuts, so I'm gonna close the door. They all sound like that, by the way, in these GM cars. So watch this, there's a local and a distance setting down here, and if you turn the radio on, that activates the power antenna. So I have it in local now, and that's as high up as it goes. But if I shift it to distant, then it extends for the remainder of its travel. And you turn it off, and the antenna retracts. Some of the Fords did that, automatically activating the power antenna and not when you turn the volume on. Other cars, like the Mark IV had, and the Thunderbirds, had a little switch sometimes down here that you would manually operate the antenna. Of course, GM did that too. In my 69 Eldorado, there's a manual switch on the radio to operate the antenna if you want it to go up and down. But this dashboard was the same, 88s, 98s, and it's, I would say, rather handsome. Uh, it's not overly luxurious. The AirSats wood here is not very convincing, but I do love the mid-century modern Oldsmobile block lettering on the glove box door. The carpeting in this, and even the 98s, was not as plush as the Marquis Brome. The Marquis Brome, you got a beautiful shag carpet. And here, you get a not bad carpet, but... It's, uh, it's not quite the same caliber. The door panels in this car compared to the Marquis also, I would say, have more hard plastic. You have this whole section that is hard plastic. You have a padded armrest. This is a nice cloth and a padded upper. But I do think the Marquis Brome was a little bit better. And certainly the door closure sound in the Ford was better. I mean, this is a very low mileage car and if I open and close the door 
just take a listen. It just doesn't sound like a quality vehicle. The Fords have much more of a click sound. I will say the ergonomics in the Oles aren't that great either. I'm sitting in the driver's seat and there's the power window switches and this is where my hand naturally stops. So I have to lean forward to activate them. Up here on the dash, these switches in the radio, I would say were made better when they redid the dash in 74, brought it more proximate to the driver. But you'll notice the Fords, if you drive them, I think the reach envelope is just a little closer. Here I am, I'm not stretching at all from where I'm sitting and I can't quite reach the radio knob. I was gonna comment, I have grease on my hands. Yes, I was working on, on the car before this. But, you know, then I, uh, I, can't I can't completely operate the radio without stretching. But GM did have different IPs for each division. Ford was starting to go to the common IP in these years. Ford and Mercury shared it. They did have a different top pad. By the way, the 73 Mercury top pad is a one-year only top pad. They changed it from 74 to 78. So in 73, it's got like this radius curve right here in the middle. And in 74, it's more of an abrupt curve. Both dash pads will work on any Mercury, but um, if you want the correct one, you have to find, uh, if you have a 73 car, a 73 only dash pad. The clock even still works in this car and ticks away. I do find this interesting. This car has no AC, but it does have the center outlet, no side outlets. You can see the plug there, but it has this open and close. I can close off the vent access. Of course, that's redundant with this pull handle down here that says center vent. So if I didn't want to have air, I just push that in. I don't have to put that to close. Probably was more expensive to develop another tool for this trim piece that didn't have that little switch there and so they just went with it. I'm going to pop the trunk. This car does have a remote trunk release in the glove box. And we'll take a look. So huge, huge trunk. And while it's big, it doesn't have that low load floor that the Mercury does have. So some people like that on the Fords, that they had the low load floor because it gave a lot of extra cargo room. Some people didn't because you had to stoop down. None of the GMs have that low load floor unless you go back to the early 60s because the fuel tank is underneath here. The fuel tank is basically, I'll call it vertical in the Ford, arguably safer. But this fuel tank is inside the frame uh, cross rails, unlike the Pinto, where that was not the case. Or the, oh, what was that? The GM, you can see the quality here. I gotta close that with a firm push. Or the GM pickups of the 70s, 80s that had the saddle tanks on the sides outside the frame. I do love the velour though really is plush. And these seats, Oldsmobile seats, the Mercury's you kind of sink into, and these are really kind of firm in a good way. They have plenty of cushion, but I wouldn't call it an overly soft padding. The Mercury doesn't matter what seat I'm in, even the back seat or the passenger seat that haven't been sat in hardly, they're just more squishy. And as we go on a drive, that impression carries over to the drive as well. So let's pop the hood. Now in 75, the 350 was standard on the Olds 88. So you get a 350 two barrel, four barrel, and the 455 four barrel V8. So this was an optional engine and unfortunately by this time the 455 was down to 190 horsepower and 350 pound-feet of torque 
So it actually lost the rocket name from the decal. Oldsmobile used to have, earlier in the 70s, it would say Oldsmobile Rocket 455, and I guess the Olds engineers just felt it didn't deserve that nomenclature anymore. Or they were trying to move more toward the corporate engine and get away from having people call it the rocket engine. Nonetheless, in spite of the the choke down horsepower rating, which in 1971, that would have been the highest horsepower low compression 455 in a Tornado, which would have been 275 net horsepower. So in just a few years, you had the Tornado with dual exhaust in 71 that was putting out 275 horsepower down to this, which had a single exhaust and was putting out 190. 72, I believe, the 455s, the single exhaust versions were putting out 225 horsepower. The duals were putting out 250. So it was even a decline from that. But this 455 at 190 horsepower and the Ford are basically rated at the same horsepower. Ford's at 195. This is 190. This has more torque, though, at 350 versus the Ford is, I believe, 335 foot-pounds of torque. But the driving impression is strange in that this vehicle drives as though it's less powerful than the Ford. It has good takeoff and torque, but it feels a bit asthmatic in the upper RPM range. And even though the Ford and the Olds are rated the same horsepower, honestly, I wouldn't have guessed that if nobody had told me and I was just driving them. This one feels like 190 horsepower, whereas the Mercury feels like it's more. And that's rare. I would say in the 60s era, the GM cars, to me, feel like they develop more horsepower and torque. I do like the Ford engines, but this year, for whatever reason, and I've driven other Olds of the same year, 75 or 76, and they feel the same way. It's a low-mileage car, so it doesn't have a worn camshaft or anything. It's just the way it is, and I've got it tuned all properly. Same with the Ford. It's not to say it's slow, it's just that the Ford feels a lot faster. Feels like it has actually more power than some of my early 70s Olds vehicles. I had a 72 Olds Delta 88 455, which did feel more powerful than this, but even that one didn't quite feel as powerful as that Marquis Brome. I don't know what's going on with that Marquis. It just, it feels like it's got a lot more than the stated horsepower. Although again, the torque on this one is really good. So let's take it for a drive. All right, here we are in the Oles. Starts right up, so quiet. So the first impression between the Olds and the Mercury is that this Olds 455 goes about its business more quietly. And yes, that's because this, this exhaust actually has the catalytic converter, the muffler, and the resonator. But I'm talking about the overall engine smoothness under the hood. And this Olds V8, I come to stop signs, and when I first got this car, it didn't run that great, so I was two-footing it quite a bit and so it wouldn't stall when I pulled up to a stop sign I find myself wanting to keep doing that because I think the motor stalled out when I let off the gas and it hasn't it just it's so smooth so quiet so in terms of smoothness I would say the same for the transmission too the c 6s some people like you know c6 c4 fmx transmissions from Ford cruise matics they all have pretty firm shifts and some people like that when I'm driving an electric car, I don't like to feel the shifts. And it's not that those transmissions are, are bad from Ford. They're actually very good transmissions. It's just a preference thing, and I prefer how these GM Turbo Hydromatic shift and the Chrysler 727s are also very smooth. There's a reason why Rolls-Royce, Jaguar, Ferrari, and other makes use these GM transmissions. And I can't think of a a third-party manufacturer who used the Ford transmissions, you know, other than 
Ford themselves. But GM sold this turbo hydromatic to many different manufacturers. The other impression here with the windows up is it is an extremely quiet cabin in here. This car is quiet at speed and I think you know the one improvement that this generation made over the previous 65 to 70 is that it was quieter on the inside. A bit more jiggly although this Olds doesn't have much of that GM jiggle and maybe that's because of the firm ride and handling package or some of the bracing. You can watch my 67 to 75. So still has enough power to chirp the tires, but you don't hear anything. I mean, here I'll floor it. No noise. I mean, <laughs> just goes about its business. The only noise you hear is the old school turn signal blinker. I will say the other thing the, from a driving perspective, the brake pedal feel in the Olds is better. I feel more confident in the brakes. They seem to have a better bite than the Mercury. The steering rack is tighter and much more direct with a slight amount of road feel even. In the GM vehicles of the era, the GM steering rack, I think, if I had to ding the Ford on one thing, it would be the steering rack all day long. It's just, you're winding the wheel, and if you don't pinky finger it, if you don't pinky finger it in the uh, Mercury and kind of wind the wheel with one finger, you're sitting there with your hands moving all over the place. It's kind of humorous. So steering, transmission smoothness, the handling of the Olds for as big of a car this is, and this does admittedly have the firm ride and handling package, so it is going to handle better. But I've had a number of these cars without it, and they handle better than the Mercury, you know, and the Fords all day long. I could run circles around the Ford and the Mercury. But if you want ride, pure, soft, smooth, quiet ride, you can't beat that marquee bro you really cannot it's just sublime nirvana on earth if that is your objective and the gm cars of this era just don't have that and mercury and ford went to such extremes that even the front stabilizer bars are pretty spindly about three quarters of an inch in diameter versus this car that's almost an inch and I guess the you know, stabilizer bar effectively takes an independent suspension and starts making it more dependent by transferring loads from side to side. And they Ford just didn't want the loads transferred. They wanted a very independent soft ride. So it just depends on what you want in a car. And truth be told, if I were a new buyer, which one would I pick? In spite of the winding wheel and the not as great a brake feel and the more stiffly shifting transmission or firmer shifting transmission I probably would have picked the Mercury just because I love the looks I think the quality is so much better I would have been disappointed if this were a new car and I, I this was delivered to me but the body fits and the imperfections that you saw that really would not have made me happy and so I can understand why people turned away from these cars. You know, as a curiosity now and a historical piece, it's not a problem. <laughs> but if I were paying big money back in the day, I don't know that I would have liked to really uh, to have to be dealing with those imperfections and having the dealer repaint them and all that. That just would have been a headache. So consequently, it would have been the Mercury for me. But as a classic vehicle, both of these cars are just loads of fun. Very quiet, very drivable. You can take them on road trips anywhere, arrive in comfort. This seat in the Olds, despite being more firmly padded, 
just like the 73 Cutlass I have, it's Olds must have had some great seat engineers because I don't know that you could improve upon this seat for comfort. It doesn't have any strange pressure points. The foam padding feels just right. Even in my 73 Cutlass, which is just a plain bench seat, that is the most comfortable bench seat I've ever sat in. So Olds was doing a lot of things right. And that's why they became so popular and the Cutlass became America's number one vehicle for a while. Now you got some of the GM jiggle with the dash over that washboard road there. Well, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. Stay tuned for more coming. So if you like the Oldsmobile and want to learn more about it, I'd invite you to take a look at my self-published article on Kindle. I'll put the link in the description below. But it's 14 pages of text and color all on the Oldsmobile, my acquisition of it, the refurbishment, and talks about a road test of the vehicle and how it compares to other contemporary cars, even beyond the Mercury that you just saw. So one of the things I'm trying to do with this is make the channel, I'll say, a more holistic experience. And I miss the old print magazines. And I used to be a writer. I thought I'd try my hand at writing an article. And so far, it's actually sold a decent number of copies. So I'm going to write another article on a comparison test here shortly. But in the interim, if you want to learn more about the Oldsmobile, check out my self-published Amazon article available electronically on Kindle. And again, I'll put the link in the description below. Thank you so much.